Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 17. And again, I want to share with you some things in my introduction that's really going to give you information related to what a disciple is, discipleship during the time of Christ, and also an introduction and a reminder of uh, John the Baptist because what we see is disciples of John coming to Jesus. And so uh, I, I realize that very often Christians speak a language that is kind of a, um, a language that is known to those who are fellow believers. And so I call it Christianese. It's a language that we speak amongst ourselves. And so there are words in that particular language, in that vocabulary, that we take for granted. We use words that have biblical meaning and assume that everybody has been trained in what that word means and all. And one of those words that we use is the word disciple. So when we introduce our study today, I'm actually going to lay a few things out for you so that you'll know what a disciple is. And that way you're going to be able to better understand who John's disciples were. And secondly, I'm going to speak a little bit about John, reminding you of who John the Baptist is. And then we'll deal with the question that's being asked of Jesus by the disciples of John. And so I'm going to give a lot of information today. Hopefully it will help you to get a grasp of some of the things that are in the Bible that can, it'll in the future help you to understand these words and, and uh, histories, etc., that will make it uh, better when you're reading the word. So Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk shrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So at this time, during the time of the writing of the gospel, there were various groups of people who gave their allegiance to various rabbis or teachers. These people would be referred to as disciples, mathetes. And that speaks of a person who is a, a, a learner. It speaks of a continuation of a relationship, so he's a permanent or she's a permanent learner. Now, it's interesting when you read your Bible that the word Christian, the word Christian is used only one time in the New Testament. The word Christians, plural, is used only two times. So the most common word that is used to refer to a follower of Christ would be a disciple. The word disciple is used some 263 times in the New Testament. It's used one time in the Old Testament. And so a disciple is somebody who is attached to a, to a teacher. They are a lifelong follower and learner. When you read your Bible, you'll note something that is also interesting, and that is this, that Jesus Christ did not commission the church to go out into all the world to make Christians. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? And I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a moment. But that's not what the Great Commission in Matthew 28 says. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He didn't say go out and make people who are going to call themselves Christians. That is not the commission of the church. We have not been called to go out and just popularize the name of Jesus so that people will begin to wear a cross as jewelry and refer to themselves on, as, on surveys as a Christian. That's not what we have been commissioned to do. 
And today, a, a lot of Americans, and, and statistically it's going down, but a lot of Americans, when asked, what is your religious affiliation, what do you believe? They will say, well, I'm a, a Christian, because it's easy to say that. But those who would say, I'm a Christian, when asked in a survey very nonchalantly, if you were in a, a, a country that, that puts to death people who refer to themselves as a Christian, if some radical individual was speaking to that person and said to them, what is your religious affiliation? I doubt very much whether a nominal would say, or a person in name only would say, oh, I'm a Christian, because they know that to be called a Christian would be also a way of signing your own death sentence. And so today what we have is a lot of people who believe themselves to be Christians, and they, they refer to themselves as being Christian. But the fact is, Jesus didn't say, go out and make Christians. He said, go out and make Christians disciples. And there is a difference between calling yourself a Christian and actually being a disciple. During the time of Christ, uh, to become a disciple required some very basic things. If I wanted to be somebody's disciple, if I wanted to follow some rabbi and I wanted him to mentor me, I wanted to become somebody who was trained to follow God in the way that this particular rabbi, this teacher was, then there would be certain things that would be involved in that. One, I, I would decide to follow the, the teacher. Two, I would memorize their words, their teachings. Three, I would learn their method of ministry. Four, I would imitate their life and character. And then five, when I was mature, I would raise up my own disciples. That's what you see in Scripture. You see, a disciple would personally decide to follow a teacher. The decision was something that came from within themselves. They had a desire to follow him. When Jesus spoke to Matthew recently and said, follow me, Matthew immediately rose up and followed him. The invitation was given, but the response came from Matthew. When Jesus was speaking in Luke 9, 23, he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. See, so it's a desire. If anyone desires to come after me, if there's an internal motivation, if there's something within them that that resonates when I'm speaking to them, Jesus would say that there's something within them spiritually that causes them to want to attach themselves. And so to be a disciple, it, it, there was a, a personal choice that I made, and I followed after this particular teacher. Not only that, as a disciple, I would memorize the words of the teacher. His lessons would be something that I would memorize in a personal way. So as a believer in Christ, a, dis a disciple of Jesus Christ, I should be memorized in his words or the words of, of the Lord. Like it says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, where it says, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Or Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's a, it's a hiding God's word, a treasuring God's word. It's a memorization. That's why scripture study and memorization is so important for disciples. A disciple also would would uh, learn the master's manner of performing their ministry. I still remember years ago now, I was at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, and I was standing next to my pastor, Chuck Smith, and, and you could see these uh, young men who were praying at the Western Wall. And, and all of us, if you haven't been to Israel, I'm certain you've seen film of these who are standing next to the wall, and, and they're putting little prayer requests into the cracks in the wall, and they'll stand there and they'll pray. And if you're there watching them, you'll note that some of these young men will be moving. Some will be moving side to side like this. Others will be moving back and forth as they're praying. And you'll watch that. And I was standing next to Pastor Chuck and I said to him, why is it that they're praying the way that they are? And he gave me two answers. He said, one, he said, the scripture says, love the Lord thy God with all your strength. And he says, so in their prayers, he says, they move because they're loving God with all of their strength. He says, that's one thing. But secondly, notice, he said, some are going side to side. Some are going in different directions. He said, undoubtedly, they learned to pray in that fashion from the rabbi. So they were being mentored even in the way that they prayed. And so you'll see them going like this. And as they're praying and all of that, and they're doing so because they believe they're loving God with all of their strength. But what it is, it's an emblem or a, an indication that they are following a certain rabbi and the manner in which he performs his ministry. In John 13, verse 15, Jesus said it like this. He said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. 
he had washed their feet, he said, that's the example. You do the same for other people. The disciple would imitate their teacher's life as well as their character. They would learn compassion. They learned ministry, how to love others and how to serve God by watching their rabbi. Jesus had his disciples with him. They would see him as he healed the sick. They would see him as he prayed for those who were in need. They, they saw him as he held infants in his hands. And as they watched them, they were learning how to practically do ministry. It wasn't just theoretical. It wasn't just going to Rabbi 101 classes. It was watching the rabbi as he was out serving. And so as they watched him, they began to know how to serve. And that's what Jesus was teaching them. You should do as I have done to you. And ultimately, they were to become like their master. In Matthew 10, 25, it's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, a servant like his master. And then again, when ready, the disciple would raise up other disciples. You see, at a certain point, we who follow examples become examples for others. Paul said it like this in Philippians 4, verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. And so that's what would happen when disciples would be attached to a mentor, a rabbi, a religious leader. John the Baptist, as we see here in this passage, had disciples. Interestingly enough, we know that at least two of them ultimately became apostles. When you read John's gospel in chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, that portion of scripture mentions Andrew, who became an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it mentions Andrew as a one-time disciple of John. There's another, uh, another disciple of John with him, and uh, every conservative Bible commentary that I've ever read will say that that's John himself. Andrew and John were also followers of John the Baptist. Interestingly enough, John the Baptist continued having disciples who followed after him even after the church was birthed. When you read the book of Acts in chapter 19, verses 1 through 8, that portion of scripture records that John still had disciples after the church was already 17 or 18 years old. So his impact was not only for that moment, but actually lasted into the years following, many years following. You see, he was a very godly man. He was a very godly man. He was a great example. He was worthy of respect and he was worthy of, of loyalty. When Jesus spoke concerning him in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus in verse 11 said, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. And so this was a great man. The name John, when you look at it, and translate what it means because often in scripture your name actually has a meaning. My name David is a Hebrew word. It means beloved. That's what my name means. Uh, John means Jehovah is gracious. That's what it means. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets and he was the one who was used to introduce us to the grace that is found in Jesus Christ. When John the apostle was writing the Gospel of John. He said in John 1.17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John was the one who was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. It says in Mark 1, 2 through 3, 2 through 3 as it, it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John, a great man, Jesus said, a great, very great man who was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. Now, the disciples of John knew that he had a spiritual pedigree. They knew he had a calling from God. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1, verse 36, that he was related to Jesus through his mother, Elizabeth. And in many ways, when you read concerning his birth, you would see it was very special. His mother was unable to conceive a child, and she and her husband, Zacharias, grew too old to have their own children. 
But in spite of this, it appears that Zacharias continued praying that God somehow would bless him with a son, and God answered their prayers. A child was given to him. He was performing, Zacharias was performing ministry at the altar of incense, and he was praying. And as that was happening, an angel by the name of Gabriel, which means man of God, was sent to give him a message. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 13, the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Jehovah is gracious. So Gabriel also gave Zacharias a prophetic glimpse of the son that would be born. If you take notes, it's found in Luke chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. You, sh you will have joy and gladness. Many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John would have a special ministry he would be a source of joy and delight, causing many to rejoice. He would be great in the sight of the Lord. He would never drink alcoholic beverages, indicating a complete separation to, to God. He would be filled with God's spirit from birth. He would effectively preach repentance. He would go before the Lord as his forerunner. He would restore the hearts of the fathers to the children through repentance. And he would be used to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. When you read about John, you discover that his preparation period lasted 30 years. And at the age of 30, he began his ministry, according to Luke 3.23. And Matthew records that his ministry was built on preaching a message of repentance. Interestingly enough, John 10.41 makes it clear that John performed no miracle, but he was an effective preacher. And he was greatly admired, and he had a number of disciples. On one occasion, when you read concerning his disciples and their loyalty and love, you discover that they had become jealous for him and for his ministry. Jesus, who had been baptized by John, was now making more disciples. And, and John's disciples got upset over that and even went so far as to tell John, the one whom you baptized, well, you know what? Many people are now following him, and they got jealous for him. But John had said to him, I must decrease, and he must increase. And he pointed them to Jesus, who's the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Apparently, his disciples hadn't listened too closely to what he was saying. But now, during the course of his ministry, he has many enemies. He had preached against an adulterous situation. And according to Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, he's now in prison. But that doesn't keep his disciples from approaching Jesus and they come, and they come with a question. Now, Matthew doesn't record how much time separates this event from the one that we already studied. He just records that some disciples of John approached Jesus, and they brought a question. Now, I want you to notice something here. These disciples of John are nobler than the Pharisees because they approach Jesus directly. This indicates that their question would be sincere, not simply out of frustration about Jesus' popularity. They really have a question so these disciples of John, according to verse 14, Matthew chapter 9, came to him saying, and here's their question, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Why would this matter so much to them? Well, I'll give you the answer from what they could see. Jesus did not seem to be devout. He did not seem to be religious. You see, at this time, religious people performed at least three outward acts that were recognized as being religious. And we looked at that when we were earlier in the Gospel of Matthew. They would give their alms, they would pray, and they would fast. What had happened is outward religious ritual had become the barometer for righteousness. And during their day, Jewish religion had adopted twice weekly fast as evidence of righteousness. So because Jesus' disciples didn't fast, they must not be devout. They must not be sincere in their faith. As is true to this day, external appearances is not always sufficient to make a spiritual judgment. But people have a tendency of 
They're judging from the outside. They look at the outside and they'll say to themselves, that person seems to be a religious person and that other person doesn't seem to be a religious person. And we can actually use outer appearance as a barometer for whether we, we think somebody's a sincere believer or not. We can do that. We've been doing that forever. We did it 2,000 years ago and it still happens to this day. And when I got saved as a young man, a hippie kid, longer hair, barefoot, When you would compare me in the way I looked, when you would compare me with, uh, with a Mormon, th that society at that time would have said, uh, that Mormon's a genuine believer in Christ, and, and that guy there, he needs a bath. And that's kind of how our society was. He, he's not the real deal. But we still have that to this day. To this day, because somebody could be dressed up nicely, could have the white shirt and, and slacks and 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 clean-cut look, and, and they can come and bring something that's not biblical, and then some tattooed and pierced guy could be sharing the gospel, and people, even to this day, have a tendency of saying, oh, that person can't be really a Christian because that person's got a tattoo, and that person's got, they got piercings, you know, and, and I'll tell you, uh, um, they will listen to the clean-cut person sometimes quicker than they would to that person they think needs to get a haircut and take those piercings out and cover up those tattoos. Tattoos, I mean, a lot of people today um, have a real problem with that, but that's not a new thing. I mean, my mom and my dad had problems with people who had tattoos. I mean, my dad was in the Navy. He never got a tattoo because my grandfather was opposed to him. My dad was in the Navy, and a lot of Navy guys, you know, they get their anchor on their arm or a battleship on their chest that sinks down to become a submarine. <laughs> you see these women who, who put their, I don't know if it's a proper, I probably shouldn't say this. Uh, <laughs> their tramp stamp. <laughs> and they put a little hummingbird in their back, you know, so cute. It, it becomes a vulture in 12 years. It, it, it. <laughs> and when they walk, it flies. I mean, come on. I, but people have problems with that. But that's a fact, isn't it? It's a, it's a fact. I mean, you'll see somebody with ink, and they say, well, this person can't be, he can't be saved. She can't be saved because they have tattoos. And that, that goes way back, way back. My, my cousin... I have cousins who grew up um, Culver City, Venice, in that area, and we're talking about in the 50s, and it's changed a whole lot since the 50s. Some of you know it's changed a whole lot. Those areas were, some of the areas were really, really, really rough, and my cousin lived in a rough area. Well, my cousin decided, my girl, she's a girl cousin, decided to get a tattoo, and she put it on, on her hand, between her thumb and finger there, it was a cross with little lines on it. Some of you know what that symbol was. It's, uh, my dad and mom said that a symbol of being a, what was called a pachuco. Yeah. <laughs> and my auntie, my aunt, Aunt Tilly, was not happy. And uh, so they didn't need laser then. She took a razor blade to it. That's right. And she cut it off with a razor blade. You're not going to be tatted in my house. See, so I, that's, that's my family. You know, my dad didn't like the ink. He didn't like the tattoos. He was in the Navy. And his father didn't like tattoos. And my brother got a tattoo on his shoulder that was maybe a half inch at the most. And my dad was so angry that he put tattoo on him. See, so that's not a, this attitude, you know, that we have today. It's not a brand new attitude. There have been attitudes like that where some will go so far as to say, oh, you can't be saved because you have that tattoo. And, and that's a, a common thing that we still see to this day. And they usually bring out a scripture out of Levit Leviticus to show us some things. And, 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 but that's the attitude that people can have. It's an outward attitude. See, man looks at the outer appearance. 
God looks at the heart. And, and what, what the Lord wants to do is he wants to show us the reality of a faith in Christ. And, and there are so many people who, who, who want to just regulate the outward. And that was taking place during that day. Why do the disciples of John and why do the Pharisees fast? And again, it was religious ritual at the time of Christ where they would fast twice a week. Why is it that they are fasting and your disciples do not? Why are your disciples not wearing your religiosity as an emblem the way Pharisees do? Even the hypocritical Pharisees is, is uh, what they're basically saying. And, and the disciples of John, we have learned that we are to fast. It is the acceptable practice of a religious person. But we've been watching you, Jesus, and we've noticed that your disciples seem to be partying all the time. They seem to be happy and all of that, and, and, and we don't get it. We don't understand. Why is that so? Well, Jesus answers in verse 15. Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? When he says, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn, in Scripture, fasting often represents voluntary humility and mourning. Psalm 35, 13 says, I humbled my soul with fasting. Psalm 69, verse 10 says, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. So fasting represented humility. It represents mourning. So Jesus' point is clear. This is not a season of sorrow. This is a season of joy. It's a time of refreshing. It's a time of rejoicing. Like, like when a young man marries his wife and the young woman and he are rejoicing at their wedding. You see, his followers, because he is with them, his followers should be rejoicing, not mourning and crying in sorrow. The believer should be rejoicing because they're with Jesus Christ. You see, being with Christ is joyful, even when we are concerned with the condition of the world, and even when we are seeing things, or things are happening uh, around us, or even in our family, there's still this, this sense of, of, of peace and joy that comes by the Spirit of God because we know that we're not alone. We know that God's in control. God is with us. And we can have a joy even in the midst of grieving. In Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, Paul said, If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. We rejoice in God. We joy in God through Jesus Christ. You see, the, the friends of the bridegroom are the groom's best friends. They were the ones who were in charge of all the festivities. And, and so Jesus is saying, my friends are to enjoy my presence and they are to be filled with the joy that my friendship produces for them. Believers should be rejoicing because of the relationship with the Lord. But he goes on to say, the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then that's going to be the time that they can mourn. Now when it says there that he'll be taken, that word uh, taken means to be suddenly seized in a violent manner. Soon the bridegroom will be violently taken from you, and at that time you'll have time to mourn, and this is referring, obviously, to him being taken to the cross and crucified. The Apostle Peter referred to this violent taking of Christ in his sermon on Pentecost in Acts 2, verse 23. It says, speaking of Jesus, that he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. But he goes on to say, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You took him violently, you crucified him. And you killed him. And so Jesus is referring to that. He's saying the bridegroom will be taken away. And at that time, there's a proper time to have sorrow in your heart. You see, the disciples of John need to understand just who Jesus Christ actually is. Their loyalty to John is getting in the way of their being saved. John's disciples have to follow Jesus. And in doing so, 
that will fulfill the ministry of John. So he goes on, and he says in verse 16, No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled out, wineskins are ruined, but they, are, but they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And so there comes a time when attempting to patch something up is actually counterproductive. Jesus is making it very clear that his ministry was not intended to somehow repair Phariseeism. He wasn't here to try and make it better. He wasn't here to try and patch it up. And we understand that. I, I don't know how many people here are old enough to remember this, and I don't even know if this is still something that continues to this day. I think that may be so. But there was a time when we actually wore our jeans until we put holes in them. We didn't buy them with holes. And that was a long time ago. We are talking about ancient history and all of that. We actually, we actually would buy jeans that didn't have holes. And um, the jeans that you would buy, the Levi's that you would buy, we're not pre-shrunk. So you would wash them and hang them out to dry. Eventually, if you were rich, you got a clothes dryer. What is so taken for granted today, we didn't have a, a dryer when I grew up. You know, the dryer was nature, was the wind and the sun. And you went out to what was called a clothes line. <laughs> and they used to have clothes pins <laughs> and and you would listen to your 33 rpm record as you no i'm just kidding <laughs> then you got a four track and an eight track and on and on but a portable phone was something with a real long line that, that you connected and you could walk around the house with it and a party line was a line that you shared with your neighbors anyway just talking to you young people and forgetting what I wanted to say. <laughs> what the Lord had given to us and what the Lord would have to us to have is a freshness of the things. And so if you bought a pair of Levi's and, and you somehow when they were still new and hadn't been washed, if you tripped and you ripped the knee, mama would go to the store and she'd buy a little patch kit. You could bring it home, you open, you know, you turn the Levi's inside out, you put the patch over it. But you better do that before you wash the jeans because if you wash them and then put that patch on and then you wash it with the patch, then the patch is going to tear away. And that's basically what Jesus is talking about because they did that during his day. The same kind of thing. He says, so you never ever put an, uh, uh, an, a patch on something that hasn't been prepared to receive it. And he's saying, I haven't come to repair Phariseeism. I'm not here to patch it up. Then he moves on and gives a second kind of illustration in verse 17 when he says, nor do people put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. And so Jesus is letting us know that the Pharisaic order is not right because it's external. And external religion promotes self-righteousness. Not only does an external only religion promote self-righteousness, but it also begins to enshrine rules and regulations that may not be found in scripture, but people have an agreement that that would be good to do, and it becomes legalistic. And you just basically stifle any of the freshness of the Spirit of God because you've created a system that doesn't allow him to work in it. It's a system that doesn't welcome the new wine of the Holy Spirit. And Jewish formal religion was not welcoming the work of God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. What happens is rit ritual religion becomes inflexible, it becomes unyielding, it becomes a system that resists the power of the Spirit, it's not led by the Spirit and therefore produces religious 
but unspiritual followers. So when I get saved, I go to church and there's a freedom that I'm experiencing amongst the people. And I have a pastor named Chuck Smith who doesn't forbid the long hair from showing up to church because again, what you have today in terms of uh, what's accepted um, fashion um, was not so acceptable at that time and long hair was something that people really had a real problem with and so Chuck didn't tell us to go out and cut our hair. He simply said, come on in and I'll give you Jesus. But after I got saved, I was reading about a particular church that was in uh, another state and it was a very large church, very well-known church and it had a barber, this church had a barber on staff. So when, true story, so when the hippie kid would come forward at the invitation to commit their life to Christ, they would go into the back for the counseling and the barber would be waiting there to cut his hair. Because everybody knows that Jesus had a real short haircut. Everybody knows that. He used to wear a valise and a suit and a tie. I mean, everybody knows that. And that is what happens. And, and that's what that kept a lot of people, a lot of my generation, it, it would keep them from coming to faith in Christ because the externalism of the religious beliefs. Because you have to look this way. You can't look that way. You, you have to have short hair. You, you know, even, even what I do now, when I stand out here and I'm wearing jeans and, and, I'm, and I'm casual, that's, you're used to that. You're, but that was not so when I got saved. That wasn't so. When a preacher preached a message on a Sunday morning back in 1970, 71 and all, he better wear his suit. He had to be attired properly. And people would complain. They'd say, you're taking the gospel less seriously because you're that way. You're not wearing your suit. We had people who left our church because we didn't have stained glass. They get into the traditionalism, the ritualism. They think that that denotes real Christianity, and they do that. Marie and I were driving through a neighborhood in Ontario years ago now, there was a man who was mowing his lawn, and I said to Marie, that's a pastor. She says, you don't know him. How can you know he's a pastor? I said, he's wearing his suit. <laughs> True story. He's there with his push mower in case, you know, somebody should show up. He's on duty. I can pray if I got my tie on. And people think that way even to this day. And you know it, and I know it. We externalize religion. If you look in a certain way, I'll listen to you. But if you don't look like I think you're supposed to look like, I don't want to hear a word you have to say. Because you don't look religious. And so that's what the Lord is dealing with. It's that mentality. It's that, that sense of stifling the Spirit of God because we're trying to patch something that is external only. John was not the Christ. He was sent to prepare the way for the Christ. For the Christ. And he wanted people to know, Jesus wanted people to know that God wanted to do a fresh work. And he uses the illustration of wine when he says, nor do people put new wine into old wineskin. Why would he use the word wine? Because in the scripture, wine can be used as an emblem or a symbol of the Spirit of God. That's why Paul would say, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess or dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Because people during the time of the writing of Ephesians would believe that when they were drinking and they got a bit buzzed, a little high, drunk, that uh, they were actually possessed by the Spirit that was within wine. And Paul says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is a lack of self-control. When's the last time you ever saw somebody get so drunk that they wanted to go out and, and, uh, and uh, do some good things? You know, they just don't. They're not out there trying to volunteer to go out and build housing for the poor when they're drunk. They don't do that. They'll talk about it, but they don't do it. Because you're not really driven to do good things when you're real drunk. You're just not. And so you're out of control, not under control. Even in the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 there in the upper room, one of the things that were said concerning them is, oh, these people are filled with new wine. Because they seem to be 
uh, speaking in a language they thought they were just babbling that was un not understood by the majority. Every one of them was speaking something a bit different. And the people there, representing 16 or 17 nations, began to hear the wonders of God in their own language. But no, initially they were saying, oh, these people are filled with new wine. And that's why the Apostle Peter said, no, men and brethren, it's not that way at all. No, we're not drunk with wine, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, who said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He said this is actually a fulfillment of what the word of God says concerning him pouring out his spirit. And so... What we are is under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we are actually to be those who are moved along by the Spirit of God. You see, traditionalism and inflexibility can end up stifling and quenching the work of the Spirit. And some aren't even open to what God wants to do. In Luke chapter 5, verse 39, it says, No man also having drunk old wine straightway desires new, for he says the old is better. People get stuck in what they think is the best way. And then they begin to harden and become inflexible. I have been praying for a long time that, that I will, as a minister of the gospel, always remain firm about what Scripture says is specifically important to know, doctrinal, cardinal doctrines, to remain very, very inflexible when it comes to compromising God's truth and to remain open to what he may want to do in a fresh way. I, I used to be an assistant pastor in another Calvary chapel. We were renting a particular church from a denominational church. And uh, the denominational church uh, board said to us, you can, um, you can bring electric guitars into the fellowship hall, but you cannot have electric guitars on the platform in the main sanctuary. They had a real problem with electric guitars. Now again, what is normal to us today was not normal back then. Pastor Chuck was looked at as some kind of radical hippie lover. They didn't really, the, the, the church of that age was losing all the hippies because they were so caught up saying, you got to change. You've got to look in a certain way. We don't like your long hair. We don't like the fact that you don't wear shoes in church. And, and, and it, you, do you know, and this, you, some of you have heard this. You'll know this is true. Some of you may have never heard this. You're young in the, in the Lord or perhaps chronologically young. Uh, but the music that we play today, do you know what it was called by the church world? It was called voodoo music. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? I want to know. Okay. Oh, you didn't know it. Voodoo. Why? Because they said it's got a hypnotic beat. And when you're playing the drums, what happens is the people are coming under the spell of voodoo. So I got a doll with some needles and I... <laughs> no. During worship. And so we were using a church for Sunday morning and midweeks, and they told us that. You cannot play electric guitars in the main sanctuary, but you can have electric guitars in the fellowship hall. And it, even then, I thought, how strange. God likes fellowship. So when we play guitars in there, he's cool with it. But he doesn't come into the main sanctuary if we have an electric guitar. It, did, it didn't make sense to me that you're, dividing up rooms in that way to the degree that they think God's okay with, because the word fellowship is less than worship. I, I've never, up to this, it's been almost 35, almost 38 years since we, I heard that, and I still don't understand that. That's legalism, that's ritualism. That is what Jesus said just doesn't work. God is creative and God is innovative. And our God does a new thing. Be careful that you don't get traditionalized. Be careful that you don't become an old wineskin. And as we're growing older, and all of us, thank God, one day at a time are a little bit older, one of the ways that you can begin to see if you're getting to be an old wineskin is if you begin to say things like, I don't get it. I don't know why they're doing that. How come they're doing that? We don't need to do that. 
wineskin. Be careful. I don't understand what's going on. You know what? Um, one, one of the things that gives me pleasure in life, one of the pleasures, and God has given me so many, thank him, I thank him for it, is watching my grandchildren growing up because they make messes. They are so messy. And they are so loud. Oh, they're loud. And rambunctious. And fresh and alive. I like that. I like the life. I like the joy. I like that. Even if it does make me tired, and indeed it does, I get tired. I go, oh, man. Settle down. Where's the Benadryl? <laughs> but I think you know what I mean. I, 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 and Christ, new Christians with life, they want, they want to see God move. They want to see God roll. And, and I'm with them on that. I want to see the Lord, uh, really, I want to see God move in our lives. As long as it's appropriate doctrinally, but I never want us to formalize our walks with God to the point where, where people who are young, exuberant in their faith, and God is ministering to the point where we as a church begin to exclude them because they're not doing it the way that we think they should do it. My very first message that I gave as, a, as our first day of a church was out of Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, where it says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Behold, I am going to do a new thing. And one of the things that I am learning about God and have learned about God is he's in the business of doing new things. He wants to do new things. And by the way, when you're saved, he even calls you that. He says, you are a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. God does new things. Behold, I, behold, I make all things new. And so Jesus is simply saying, listen. Your rabbi John taught you religious disciplines as a godly man. The Pharisees have religious disciplines because they're legalists and are not open to the Spirit. John came in preparation for the one who was to follow. That was Jesus. I have come to do a new thing. So rather than getting caught up with the old, be open to the new. And the new would be faith in Christ who has come to pour his Spirit on those who follow him. John prepared people for that. Jesus said, but it's like, it's like a wedding. He said, I am here, and as I'm here, there's a time of rejoicing. Don't become an old wineskin, but allow the work of the Spirit in your life to have freedom so that God may move because Jesus is the one who sends the Spirit to dwell within those who follow him so that we might have the joy of walking with Christ every day in anticipation with being with the one who makes things new. So may our lives be filled with his love, with his joy, with his compassion, with his concern, with his heart for others. May we live in such a way that we do fast, that we do pray, that we do give, but may we do that with a heart because we love Christ, not because it's an emblem or an indication that I'm religious, but simply because that's what believers do. And we do it not to force other people to do it. We do it because he has, he has compelled us to. And so it comes from within us to follow Jesus, not some outward rule, but some inner passion to follow Christ, to love him and serve him forever because he is the one who gives to us the new wine. May the Spirit work in us to that end.